King James says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. As we open the uh, sacred pages of Scripture to our text, to the unilateral, unilateral book of John, we find Jesus early in his evangelistic ministry. In chapter 1, John the Baptist has testified of Jesus to the Pharisees and proclaimed him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We also hear Jesus speak for the first time in John's historical account of his ministry, words that encapsulate the purpose of his of every Christian. Two powerful words found in chapter 1, verse 43. Follow me. Not serve me or worship me, but follow me. The first command of Jesus, follow me. These two magnificent words represent the first command given by the Savior. He's saying, in effect, that in order to be like me, in order to do like me, and in order to have the things of God like me, you must follow me. We're called Christians or Christianas, not because we are saved and washed in his blood. That's redemption. We're called the redeemed because of that. But we're called Christians because we are followers of Christ. In this gospel, the word grace is not mentioned once by Jesus, but rather it is exemplified as we see him calling folks from all walks of life to be his disciples, ordinary people, people to whom men of high degree paid no attention. He just called ordinary folks, saying, follow me. Jesus did not require anything of them other than they just follow him. When they followed him, they witnessed supernatural and awesome things. They witnessed things that eyes had not seen nor ears had heard, things that never entered the minds of men. Jesus performs a miracle at the wedding of Cana of Galilee right before their very eyes when he takes six water pots used for the ceremonial washing of hands and feet, dirty water, and turn that water into wine. They also beheld his power and authority when he whipped the merchants and the money changers out of the house of God in chapter 2, verses 16, beginning at verse 16, and announced to them his ultimate purpose, his death and resurrection in chapter 2, verse 19. Now all of these things that were happening had stirred up the curiosity of the religious leaders. These leaders were devout Jews that, that consisted of scribes who interpreted the law of Moses and the Pharisees who kept and enforced the law of Moses and the Sadducees whose purpose was to keep the law but also to keep the peace between the Jews and their hegemonic rulers, the Roman governors. Now in our text we read these words in the King James Version, chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man. Now, before we go any farther, look at chapter 2, verses 30, 23 through 30, 25. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name or on his name. And when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself. Jesus did not, receive, did not allow them uh, to... to uh, convince him of their belief, and to, uh, but, but because he knew all men and needed not that they should testify of him, for he knew what was in man. The Message Bible says he could see right through them. Oh, blessed be the name of God. All of the laurels 
charge that they put upon Jesus, Jesus would not accept that as influence that they were with him because Jesus knew them. He knew what was in man. He could see right through them. It is implied here that Jesus, although his mission was to save folk, knew the nature of men. That no matter how they tried to conceal who they were and their true purpose, he could see right through them. Whether you know it or not, Jesus sees right through you. You may be able to fool your pastor and the people with your religious spirit, but Jesus sees, oh, come on, Holy Ghost, sees right through you. Then the writer goes on to say that this man whom Jesus could see right through was a Pharisee, and his name was Nicodemus, meaning conqueror of the people. He goes on to say, and this man who Jesus could see right through, whose name means conqueror of the people, was a ruler of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council, the Jewish Supreme Court. He was somebody, somebody. And not only that, he was one of the few Pharisees who was very wealthy because he was able to buy the spices that they put upon Jesus' body after he was crucified. Very expensive stuff. So Nicodemus was somebody. The text goes on to say that he came to Jesus by night under the cloak of darkness. No one could see him at night. Unlike today, there were no artificial lights that burned through the night in the city to light the deeds of night dwellers. <laughs> Note, if you will, what Jesus said in verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. It is apparent that Nicodemus had an agenda that he felt could not be executed in the light of day. He came to Jesus when no one could see who he was. He came by night. He, Nicodemus, opens the dialogue with these words. Rabbi, we know, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Please note, if you will, that he uses the plural possessive pronoun, we, not I know, but we know, which implies that he did not come out of personal curiosity, but he came on behalf of his party. He came on behalf of his sect. And even perhaps he came on behalf of the scribes and the Sanhedrin. We know, we know. We know who you are. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Then he goes on to say, hallelujah, that you're not like us. You did not come from us. You had to come from God. He was saying in this, in effect, you ain't nothing like us. We have read about miracles, but you do miracles. We have read about the power of God, but you have the power of God. We know that you couldn't have come from around here. You had to come from God. Folks know when God has sent you. But Jesus is not impressed with Nicodemus' evaluation and designation. He is not the littlest little bit impressed. <laughs> Jesus could see right through him. He knew his true agenda. Listen to this, all of us who are in Christ Jesus ought to be able to discern the true agenda of people and not be influenced by their compliments and their praise. By, be not influenced by their sanctimoniousism. 
be not <laughs> impressed by how they act in worship, how well they can preach or pray or sing or shout. If you have the power of Christ in you, you ought to be able to see right through them. Well, I'm going to preach this thing on today. I don't care if you go say amen or not. Jesus immediately takes control of the dialogue and the subject matter. Nicodemus was seeking information about Jesus. But Jesus gives him information about himself. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus does not acknowledge anything Nicodemus had said because he could see right through him. He shares with him something that Nicodemus had never heard in his life. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, what did this have to do with Jesus being a great teacher come ex from God. Nicodemus came to learn a little bit more about this man Jesus. He wanted to know some secrets about Jesus. He, he wanted to uh, get intimate with Jesus. He wanted, to, uh, he wanted to impress him so that Jesus would share with him some stuff that he didn't needed to know that he could take back to the council so that they could make an evaluation of Jesus. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, I'm going to tell you something about yourself. You must be born again. Stay with me now. He didn't say that you must be redeemed. Now stay with me now for just a minute. He hadn't gone to Calvary yet. So there was no redemption yet. But he's saying, Nicodemus, with all that you are, you need to be born again. Of course, he did not understand what Jesus meant because he was a religious man and not a spiritual man. Oh, come on, somebody. That's the reason why some folks cannot understand the message. Because you are religious and not spiritual. You cannot hear what the Spirit is saying. That's why some folks take a message wrong. Because you're not spiritual. You're just religious. Oh, can somebody say, go ahead and preach this thing. He was one who understood the letter of the law, God, but not the spirit of the law of God. No, 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 no. Just let me just stay there for just one minute, just one minute. You cannot preach God's word unless you're preaching the spirit. Hallelujah. You're preaching with the spirit of God within you so that folks are not just getting law and rules and regulations, but they're getting life because the Bible says my words are spirit and they are life. When you preach the word of God, no matter how hard that word is, folks ought not leave this place in a lugubrious spirit. They ought to leave this place alive, shouting the joy, even though they were under conviction of the word of God. Because the Lord said, my word is spirit, and they are life. Can somebody give the Lord a clap offering for his word? Remember, 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 Jesus said of the Pharisees in Matthew 23 through 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything. Let me inject this, and I'll share this with you a little bit later. Jesus had no problems with the Pharisees. What he had was a problem with their practice. Jesus was not criticizing them for what they believed. 
but rather how they practice what they believe. Now let me say that again. Jesus did not criticize them for what they believe because they believe the right thing. Holiness and righteousness and worshiping God. True worship of God and not idols. He wasn't criticizing them for what they believe, but he criticized them for the practice of what they believe, the tone of how they set it out, their attitude. And what they believed that Jesus had a problem with, it's how they practice what they believe. Tell somebody he preaching now. Somebody tell somebody he preaching now. Tell, tell somebody I might be confused. Maybe he's teaching now. I don't know what it is. Look, Jesus, like all devout Jews, respected the purpose of the Pharisees. For in principle, their desire was for there to be authentic worship and holy living. The Pharisees were descendants of the Kashidim, who along with others and the Maccabeans waged war against Antiochus Epiphanes, who had, during his conquest of Israel, desecrated, desecrated the temple. And folks were following uh, the ways of idol worship. Pharisees were descendants of the Kassidim that wanted to restore true worship of God. These men, the Pharisees, in theory, had godly intentions, but somewhere along the road of life had wandered into darkness. Jesus takes this opportunity to let this man, whose original purpose was to restore holiness and true worship, know that you've got it all wrong. The life that you're living is not right. You've got to be born again. That no matter how much good he wanted to do, he could not do the good that needed to be done in the state that he was in. He needed to be born again. Jesus shocks Nicodemus with this statement. It was a ridiculous and ludicrous assertion, assertion rather, that a man could go back into his mother's womb and be birthed again. Now, mo one must, now most of us think that this passage was speaking of redemption but in fact Jesus does not use this directive with anyone but Nicodemus he does not tell his disciples you must be born again before you can follow me he just said follow me Nicodemus needed something to happen on the inside of him before he could be a part of the Lord's army because if he had not have if something had not happened in his life he would come into the fold and be disruptive in the fold. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. He's saying, Nicodemus, you've got it right. You've got the word. You're filled with the word. You know righteousness. You know holiness. But as for yourself, there needs to be a rebirth. There needs to be a washing. There needs to be a filling of the Spirit of God because Nicodemus, these folks that I called before, the disciples that I just called, they're folks that know nothing of the law. Here you are. You are a theologian. You're deep in the law, but your practice, your practice is not of God. So Nicodemus, you Pharisee, you need to be born again. And except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom. Is, is anybody listening? He was saying, he was not saying that he should not be who he was, but rather he, but rather he was who he was on the outside but not who he was on the inside. What you say you are, people can look at you and say, oh, he holy. But on the inside, there was no holiness. <sighs> can I get an amen from Latrell over there? You look holy. You dress holy. You act holy. 
You're so holy that when you see a beautiful woman walking down the road, you close your eyes so that you won't see her, that you might be tempted. So, so many of you just walk into walls, bumping yourself. They got the nickname of the bruised and the bleeding. You're so holy. You're so holy that you want everybody to know that you cannot be tempted. You're holy on the outside, but on the inside, there ain't no holiness. Oh, God, I wish somebody would help me preach this. <laughs> Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Jesus is not going to die on the cross and rise on the third day morning until three years after. Nicodemus, you need something to happen in your life right now. Oh, blessed be the name of God. <laughs> yes, baby, I hear you. And the baby said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wonder if somebody can shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Except you be born again of water and the spirit, a man cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, y'all thinking about heaven. But remember, Jesus said on two occasions, once on the Sermon of the Mount, he said, Pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then he said on another occasion, when he was talking to his disciples and the Pharisees again, that the kingdom is among you. So what he's saying in essence is that the kingdom of God that's here right now, you cannot see it. And it's right among you. You need to be washed. You need to be filled with the Spirit. I believe that this is a message to the people of God today. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. Now, maybe this does not affect you. Maybe you're saying this is for someone else. And that you're taking copious notes so you can go and preach it to somebody else. No matter what you think. Let me tell you, this is a message not for the sinner, but a message for the saints of God. You know the word. You teach the word. You can regurgitate scriptures. You even can pray for the sick and they recover. But somehow... What's being done on the outside is not manifested on the inside. And your works is being evil spoken of. Because they're dead men's bones on the inside. I'm sorry, this is what the Lord gave me. This, 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 this is what the Lord gave me. Sometimes I cry before the Lord. You don't know. I tell you, I don't know how I have any more tears to cry. Because I tell you, I don't cry. For, the sinners don't bother me. I have no problems with sinners. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't mind if the church was packed with sinners. Sinners give you no trouble. Y'all ain't hearing nothing. No, they really don't. Sinners are all right with me. I wish every Sunday I'd have a packed church of sinners. Because sinners, they're fresh and they just want to hear what you've got to say. They, wanna, they want their lives to be changed. They tell me something good. But 
the saints can have you down in sackcloth and ashes. You can do some stuff, oh my goodness, that'll have you all discombobulated all week long. Let me tell you about them. And oftentimes they don't really mean to, but it's because they're no longer on fire for God. They're on fire for themselves, but not on fire for God. Look at me, who I am. Praise the name of Jesus. You know, you know, you know, I was at a service yesterday and all the, the preachers were up front saying, leave me alone. Do I have to do anything up there? No. Then I'll sit right here because I am not about being seen. I'm about doing the work of the Lord. And if, if there's nothing for me to do in that service, I become as one with the congregation. Y'all don't hear me what I say. Mine does not recognize me because I'm Bishop L. Fultrue. That's who I am. I'm going to walk into this place, and when I walk in, you shall notice who I am. And you shall give me a seat among the elite. The devil is a liar. God did not call us to be elitists. God called us to follow Jesus. Tell me where in the scriptures did Jesus desire the praise of men, desired high places. You all don't hear me what I say. Jesus moved among those who had need of him. Shout hallelujah. It's time for the saints to be born again. Somebody ought to give God some praise. It's time for the saints to be born again. No, 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 let me tell you this. Let me, let me tell you this. 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 I speak this word today not to be critical, but we're living in times now where the... And, let me tell you about, and I know some folks don't believe in demons, but let me tell you folks, demonic forces today are more formidable than ever before. And I'm going to tell you why they are more formidable. It is because these forces today have had centuries to learn about us. Y'all don't hear me. They know that they have no power over us. They know that they cannot snatch us out of the hand of God. They know that they cannot affect our spirit. These forces know that there's nothing, that they, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. These forces know that, Sister Clara. They know that. They, they know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The forces, the forces know that. So what these forces do, is they prey on our humanity. Oh, I know that, there it is, somebody said there it is. See, we're still human beings, although the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. So what these forces do, remember the scripture says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice, we wrestle not against, not with, against. Our fight is against. Hallelujah. We will win this war against the enemy. And the enemy knows that he can't win this battle. Oh, I wish somebody would shout hallelujah. 
The devil knows that he cannot. He knows that the battle is already won. I dare somebody to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the battle is already won. The battle against sin is won. The battle against death is won. The battle against sickness is won. The battle is won. The battle. I wish somebody would shout, the battle is won. That doesn't sound like a victory shout. I wish somebody would shout, the battle is won. And I dare somebody to give the Lord a victory dance. I, I dare you to stand on your feet and give the Lord a victory dance, a victory praise. The battle is won. The battle is won. Ha. Ha. On Calvary, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, and with his stripes, and with his stripes, we are healed. Take your seats if you can. I'm not the, the battle. So the battle is won, but there's always that proverbial but. But what the enemy wants to do, the demons want to do, is take your attention off your victory. He wants you to see stuff. Stuff that really don't matter. Oh, can I go over here and talk to somebody? He wants you to focus on stuff that don't matter. But it consumes you. Consumes your mind and your spirit. Consumes your behavior. You've already won the battle. But because you're consumed about how you feel and your position... The attitude that others have towards you. Your attention is taken off of the victory that you have. I, I know somebody just got that. And because we are so carnal today, you know what I'm talking about. Everything else comes before God. Everything else comes before our prayer life. See, you're not listening. Everything else comes before the study of God's Word. Everything else comes before the worship of God. But we have become like the Pharisees. We're redeemed, but we ain't Christians because we ain't following Jesus. Let me say that again. 
You can be redeemed and on your way to see the soon coming king, but still ain't no Christian because you ain't following Jesus. Can somebody give a Bible study here? Christianus, Christian followers of Christ. So don't be talking about you a Christian. Just say, I'm redeemed. But if you ain't following Jesus, you ain't nobody's Christian. Can I just talk for a minute? Have you ever heard Jesus come against someone who is poor and needy, whose spirit is down, and begin to bring that person down even more? Jesus lifted folks. 